Hello, uh, my name is Matt Johnson, and I'm the project manager for the Grove Street Neighborhood Greenway Pilot Project. The meeting will be getting started in a few minutes, so if you'll just bear with us, we will be getting started shortly. Thank you very much. Uh, so again, my name is Matt Johnson. I'm a project manager with the Montgomery County Department of Transportation. Um, I want to remind everyone that um, this meeting is being recorded, so um, keep that in mind. If you don't want your likeness or your voice recorded, please uh, don't use your webcam or speak during the um, portion of the presentation where you can um, ask questions and answers or make comments. If you would like to submit a question or comment without speaking, you can use the chat feature. Um, we're gonna show you how to do that in just a minute. I also wanna ask you all to bear with us. This is uh, one of our first times doing a, a meeting in this particular format, so I'm sure there are gonna be some hiccups. Um, I hope that you understand that we're learning just like you're learning the, what the sort of new normal is. So please be patient as we go through. Um, so uh, just to get everyone oriented. I, I did mention this already, but you are all on mute um, and you cannot unmute yourself. Um, but we will be able to unmute you later during the question and answer and comment period and also during the breakout sessions that we're going to be doing. Um, if you would like to request to speak, um, you can use the raise hand feature, which we're going to show you in just a minute. Um, also, once we unmute you here, you're still probably going to have to click a button that's, that pops up that um, confirms you want to be unmuted so that we, we don't have the ability to unmute you without your consent. Um, and if you've dialed in by telephone and you're not using the computer interface, um, you can unmute yourself by dialing star six on your telephone hand handset. Um, your video camera is off by default when you join. We want to try and reduce that bandwidth, so please don't turn your webcam on um, unless you're a member of the staff or consultants here. So if you want to ask a question using the chat feature, um, the way you do that is, um, you can see the presentation here, there's a button at the bottom of your screen that says chat. It may look a little different depending on which, which version of Zoom you're using, but there should be a chat window at the bottom. You click that button and a separate window will pop up or it may be a sidebar. Um, select in um, that chat window, um, you want to select Kyle Lucas. Kyle Lucas um, should be at the top of that list. He is the host of the meeting and he is going to be the person to send questions to or comments um, during the meeting. Um, if you want to raise your hand, the way you do that, a little, unfortunately, a little more complicated. First, you click participants here. That will open up a new um, window or a sidebar and then you click the blue raise hand button. This will alert the staff that you have a question. We will un unmute you, but we're not taking uh, questions at this time. Also, if you want to reduce the, uh, if you want to increase the size of the people who are on your screen, um, there is a setting. If you click the little up arrow next to start video uh, and then click video settings, make sure that hide non-video participants is checked and that will hide all the black squares that just have initials in them so that you're only seeing those of us who are on the staff or the consultants. So that being said, this is again, uh, my name and content information. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, most of us are working from home due to COVID-19. Uh, so um, we really prefer you use email for a, a quick response. Um, you, you, if you do call, we can check our voicemail remotely, but um, it's a little bit more challenging than um, if we were in the office. So email is preferred and this kind of information will show up again later in the, in the presentation. So you, you don't have to write it down right now, you will get another chance to see it. Um, tonight, I just wanna tell you what we're, what we're planning to do tonight. Um, you can see that we are in the, uh, we've done the overview of Zoom features. We're about to do introductions. Uh, we're then gonna do the meeting presentation and we will um, follow that with some breakout sessions and a report back period. And then following that, we'll have a question and answer period and a comment period. Um, so I just want to do a couple introductions. Um, I'm not going to go through um, and have everyone say anything just because of the uh, size of the uh, of the audience here uh, and the size of the, the crowd, but um, we do have some people from, from Montgomery County DOT here. Uh, again, my name is Matt Johnson. My supervisor, Corey Pitts, is here. Uh, he's the planning unit manager. Also, we have um, Dan Sheridan, uh, who is the, um, the planning and design um, unit uh, section chief. Uh, Tim Couples, uh, who is the um, Division of Transportation Engineering uh, Chief, is here. We also have uh, our bikeways coordinator, Pat Shepard. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Kyle Lucas, Angel Chang, are here. Also, Michael Paler from our Division of Traffic, uh, Chief of Traffic Engineering, is here. From uh, the Planning Commission, we have David Onsbacher and Katie Mancrini. And then from our consulting team with Stantec, we have um, the project manager, Dave Merrihue. Um, another project manager, Steve Sender, 
uh, Robert Milstead, Andrew Aguilar, uh, and Lori Adgate. I think I got everybody. Also, um, I did see it looks like um, uh, Hans Reamer has joined us, I believe. I saw his name come up, um, although I don't see it in the list now. Do we have any other elected officials or um, staff from elected officials? If you could click the raise hand button to let us know that you're here. Um, that would be great. I don't see any hands. So it looks like uh, that's it. So um, going back to the presentation now, um, I just want to kind of set some goals for what the, the meeting is intended to cover tonight. Uh, we are here to get feedback from, from you about some conceptual treatments. This is basically, we're going to present a menu of options to you, um, but we are not proposing a specific implementation plan tonight. So you're not seeing a specific proposal. Uh, we are going to come back in a couple months, probably early fall, with a more specific proposal where we've taken the feedback that you've given us tonight and we've combined that um, into a plan and you will get a chance to comment on that plan at that time. So it won't be a set in stone at that point, it'll be a chance for us to come back and get some additional feedback from you before we do an actual implementation. So tonight, we just wanna get your thoughts about the different treatments, the schedule, and any other feedback that you or your neighbors have. So uh, I wanna thank you all again for, for coming out. I know that there are uh, many things that you could be doing with your evening, and I appreciate that you're taking the time to engage with us tonight. Uh, so. Grove Street, you can see the project map here on the screen. There is a, a green line here showing um, the, the length of Grove Street. This is the, the project limit uh, from Sligo Avenue in the south up to Bonifont Street in the north. Uh, and you can see uh, two pictures of Grove Street here on the left. These are sh these were both taken in May, so they do sort of reflect the COVID-19 situation, but, but before the shared street was implemented there. Um, the reason we're doing this, this project is because Grove Street has been designated as a neighborhood greenway in the Bicycle Master Plan, which was adopted at the end of 2018. Um, and we are looking at doing a pilot project, which means we're gonna test out features. We're not making permanent changes to the roadway. And I do wanna point out, because we have gotten this, um, this comment before, uh, there is a resurfacing project that is going to be taking place on Grove Street and in some of the surrounding streets. It's being done by the Division of Highway Services uh, sometime later this summer. So that's a separate project from this project, but Grove Street's gonna be a lot smoother in the near future. I know that I'll, we have gotten some, some concerns about the quality of the pavement. And so please know that, that that work is gonna happen before any of the work that we're talking about tonight. So what is a neighborhood greenway? If you were at our January meeting, you probably um, saw this exact same slide, but just to go over it again, a neighborhood greenway is a street designed to give walking and biking priority and to reduce vehicle speed and volume. And there are different tools that we can use to create um, a neighborhood greenway, and they include things like signs, pavement markings, speed and volume countermeasures, um, things that will discourage through trips, and also um, ways to create safe and convenient crossings of arterial streets for bicyclists and pedestrians. So that's what a neighborhood greenway is. And just these are some examples, and you're going to see more detail on these going forward, but um, we have examples of speed treatments uh, on the top and examples of diversionary treatments on the bottom. These are just, again, just examples of uh, ways that we can create neighborhood greenways. Now, we call this a pilot project. Now, we call it that because we are not proposing to make permanent changes at this time. What we want to do is um, try out some different treatments in consultation with you, the community, um, observe the results, and then make changes to improve the effectiveness of, of the greenway treatment. So what we're proposing are gonna be what we call semi-permanent treatments. And these are things that can be easily removed, modified or relocated without any major damage to the roadway. Uh, and during this pilot, we are gonna collect both speed and volume. In this case, volume means the number of cars, not the sound of the cars. We're gonna collect speed and volume data to see how effective the treatments are. And we are not just looking at Grove Street, we are also looking at the adjacent streets as well. That's an, another comment that we have heard from, from you. So the schedule um, tonight, uh, the schedule for the, for the, the project, um, back in January, we had a community meeting, uh, which I'm sure many of you were, were at. Uh, we then um, collected baseline data uh, starting in February uh, of 2020. And based on that data, we then um, worked to um, create some, some, some of the treatments that you're gonna see tonight. And now we're here at this July 2020 meeting. And going forward, our plan is to have a stage one part of the pilot in fall of 2020, where we have speed treatments only, and that would, that would follow a meeting before that at the beginning of the fall. And we would, collect, we would collect data during that period. 
and then a stage two in spring of 2021 where we would add at least one diversionary treatment to those set of speed treatments that were added in, in stage uh, one. And again, there would be a, a public meeting before that, uh, before that um, uh, stage two went into place. And then following that, we would again collect more data and then have a follow-up meeting probably sometime at the beginning of summer of 2021 to give you a chance to reflect on what's actually happened and to um, tell us whether you think there should be changes um, or whether we should work to make this, these things permanent. Um, so I, I do wanna give people a chance, just we're gonna try and break up the meeting a little bit with an opportunity. So if you have any clarifying questions, not comments, but any clarifying questions, if you could um, raise your hand, use the raise hand feature. Again, you need to click on the participants button and then um, click raise hand. I don't see any hands. Um, but if you have any, oh, we do have a hand. I'm going to unmute you. Anne, uh, I have unmuted you. You may have, you may still have to click a button to confirm that you're being unmuted. Hello, this is Anne. And okay. yes, I can hear you, Anne. Go ahead. But, uh, I see that in, um, you'll make a change currently. Grove is just for pedestrians. And this summer, you will change it to traffic on there? Well, we're going to talk about that in, a little, in, a, in just a minute. So that's a good All question. Right, good. If you can just hold off on that, we will, um, we, will ask that, we will answer that question shortly. Thank you. Thank you. We got a couple okay. questions uh, coming in on the chat window here, Matt. Um, one question is, what are the adjacent streets? Uh, well, we, we do have a map on our webs on the Grove Street webpage that shows the count locations, but we are measuring, um, and, and Dave, Dave Merrick, if you want to correct me if I'm wrong, but we're collecting data on all, all the blocks of Grove Street. We're also collecting data on Fenton Street, on Houston Street, and on all the side, all the east-west streets as well. Did I miss any locations there, Dave? Yeah. Probably the yeah, there we go. Or, or Robert, yeah, either one. Yeah, that, that, that covers the uh, area that we're collecting data on. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah. One more question, Kyle, and then we're gonna move on. Yep, uh, the next question is, uh, if walking is priority in the Greenway and baseline speed data was already under slash around the speed limit, why are changes focused on speed treatments only in stage one? So that's an excellent question, and we're going to get to that as we go through the presentation. We're going to talk exactly about that. So if you'll just hold on to that thought, we will um, come back to you. Um, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and move on because we do have a lot to cover. And if there are any questions that we don't get to, uh, make a note of those and ask them at the end or talk to one of the, any of the, uh, the staff or consultants who are here. Um, so as you are probably all aware, uh, by now, back in June, last month, we installed a temporary shared street on Grove Street. And uh, this was done, this is not really part of the same project um, as, as the project that we're talking about tonight. It was a separate effort by the, by the county DOT to create more space for social distancing uh, for COVID-19. And it's not limited just to Grove Street. There are other streets throughout the county that have, are getting treatments like this and other treatments to create additional um, space for social distancing. So this, of course, related because Grove Street was, was designated as a neighborhood greenway in the master plan. That's why it was, uh, this was the street was selected for this temporary treatment. Um, the plan right now is to leave these treatments in place until we install stage one of the pilot in fall 2020. So as one of the questions uh, alluded to, what that means is right now it will be closed to through traffic, but then in the fall when we install the speed treatments, it would then be open again to, to drivers uh, and these, these treatments would go away. So that's, we, we are gonna ask you your, about your preferences about that later. Um, in the meeting, but for now that's just to give you an overview of, of where things are. So as we mentioned, stage one is going to focus on speed treatments only, and these, as the name suggests, are designed to slow down drivers through a combination of, of tools, and we can generally categorize these into three different categories. So uh, the first is vertical deflection, and that means the driver has to go up and over an obstacle, so like a speed hump is a good example of that. Um, the, the next category is horizontal deflection, and that one works because you have to turn your steering wheel, and that also encourages you to slow down as you drive through the corridor. And then finally, narrowing makes the roadway, it either makes it feel narrower or it actually makes it narrower, and that creates an incentive for drivers to slow down. So we're just gonna kind of go through these, and I am trying to move quickly because we do have a lot to cover. So 
uh, temporary, we're showing temporary speed hump. This, this is a rubber treatment um, that would be bolted into the roadway. So it would not be a permanent treatment that could be removed later. Um, I'm sure you're all very familiar with, with these. Now, because these are rubber, there may be a need to remove these in the winter months, potentially. We're gonna try and avoid doing that during the pilot phase. Um, but if we were to keep these in place instead of upgrading them to asphalt, they, may, they might need to get removed during the winter months, potentially. Now, a variant of a speed hump is what we call a speed cushion. These are very similar to speed humps, but in this case, uh, they have gaps between them and, and they're designed so that the, the width of a larger vehicle, like a fire truck or an ambulance, um, though they, since they have a larger wheelbase, they can drive and sort of bypass speed humps, but since passenger cars have smaller wheelbases, they would be hard pressed to, to miss them. Um, now, these are typically used um, in situations where you have a lot of emergency vehicle responses, which Grove Street is not really, it's not like on a route to a fire station or anything, so it's probably not necessary, but this is one variant um, that we could install potentially. Uh, and then a speed table, also very similar, just has a, a larger um, flat spot on the top, so it's sort of a wider treatment, um, and very, but otherwise very similar. Um, now, horizontal deflection that you, you've heard about uh, heard me talk about horizontal deflection before. This is where you have to use your steering wheel to turn to go around obstacles. So uh, the the image of the graphics all show sort of a, a stylistic view of these and then the, the images on the bottom show permanent treatments. We're not talking about installing permanent treatments. Um, but a splitter island is something that's in the middle. You have to drive to go around. Um, a chicane is something that creates a weaving motion. And a mini roundabout would be an intersection style treatment that would um, but in the middle of the intersection as opposed to um, in the block. So here's an example of a splitter island. The ones that we install in Grove probably wouldn't look exactly like this. There aren't a lot of pictures um, that we could find of, of uh, semi-permanent uh, splitter islands, but something like this, like a rubber style curb that can be bolted into the roadway with some flex posts. Um, one of the challenges here is that because we need to have tra traffic shift to go around it, we would have to remove a little bit of the curb from being available for street parking. Uh, so not a whole lot, but potentially two or three car lengths, uh, maybe a little bit more. Um, and also because there's only parking on one side of Grove Street and it's a, it would sort of be a straight shot on the southbound trip. So it would probably only be effective at slowing down a northbound traffic as opposed to slowing down both directions. Now a chicane, this is an example from Lakewood, Ohio of a chicane using paint and flex posts. There are other treatments that wouldn't necessarily have to look like this, but to create that sort of weaving motion, this would require some reduction on street parking, and it would require more than the splitter island because of the, uh, the length necessary for that uh, weaving motion to take place. Uh, and then a mini roundabout, this is an example of a treatment inside an intersection um, that's from, from Rock, Rockford, Illinois, with using interim type treatments. Um, and this could be effective because it um, would discourage stop sign running, or at least if someone does run the stop sign, they have to slow down to do it. Um, but the challenge, at least on some of the streets, is how larger vehicles navigate this. We do have uh, ride-on bus routes that run east-west on a couple of the streets. Um, so this may not be appropriate at those intersections. And we also have to worry about what happens if a large vehicle does drive down Grove Street. I know it's, they're, they're prohibited by uh, regulation, um, but if they were to do that uh, and they get here and they can't navigate around this, it could create issues. So it's another thing that we have to consider as part of the design of these. And then also, this would probably be, not be effective at slowing down people between the intersections. This would only be slowing people down in the intersections, but we would be using these in combination with some of the other treatments that you've seen tonight. And then in terms of narrowing, and what you can see in the images on the bottom there, they show, uh, the one on the left shows a permanent treatment where they've, uh, the, the uh, jurisdiction has installed some plants, plantings inside the, 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 the choker. Uh, and chokers and bump outs are basically the same thing. The, the biggest difference is that a choker or a neck down happens in the middle of a block and a bump out is happening at an intersection that's designed to um, reduce the crossing distance for pedestrians. So here's an example of a uh, interim treatment for a, for a neck down um, with using modular curb. This would require removing probably one parking space, maybe, maybe more than one. Um, and this is an example of a, of a semi-permanent uh, bump out. This is actually a picture from the District of Columbia uh, where um, DDOT installed this using paint and flex posts and created uh, a uh, sort of safer pedestrian crossing here. Now the challenge here is if, again, with larger vehicles, if a larger vehicle is trying to turn and navigate this intersection, uh, that driver may have challenges with the tighter curb radii. Um, so we, we're going to have a poll question that's going to pop up here. 
um, in just one minute, you're going to get a chance to, um, you should see a question on your screen now. So I'm going to give people about 30 seconds to vote. Um, I see people are voting. Um, and uh, this, we're asking you if you think speeding is a problem on Grove Street. Uh, so it looks like almost everyone's voted, but we're going to give you a few more seconds to vote, about 10 more seconds, and then I'm going to close the polling here. Um, all right, about three more seconds. I'm closing the poll. Last call for voting. Um, and I'm going to share the results here. So what you can see here is that 59% um, of you here tonight think speeding is a problem. Um, that's 23 of you. Um, 13 of you think speeding is not a problem. That's about a third. And 8% aren't sure. They don't know or they're not sure. So that's helpful um, to know. That's helpful information. Um, so what that means here, let's, let's see what, it, what we found from our study. So I want to describe what this graphic is showing. What we're showing here is the 85th percentile speed. So this is the speed at which 85% of drivers are at or below. Or taken the other way, 15% uh, of drivers are going faster than the speeds you see. So going northbound, southbound, there you can see the different numbers on either side of Grove Street. Northbound between Silver Spring and Thayer, 21.6 uh, miles per hour is the 85th percentile speed, and uh, it's also 21.6 uh, on the next block between Thayer and Bonifont. In the southbound direction, it's 22.3 between Bonifont and Thayer, and 23.4 between Thayer and Silver Spring. Um, so we can also look at the weekend. The numbers are very similar. Um, they're a, a little bit higher, um, but, but, but very, uh, very minor difference here. And what this means is that 85, in the 85th percentile, everyone is below the, uh, every, every, all the 85th percentile speeds are below the posted speed limit. And what we found was, uh, if we look at the top speeds, this is where it gets a little bit more alarming. The top speed that we recorded, and again, this is just one driver who was going this fast, but um, if you look at the top speed on a weekday, we did record a speed of 43.3 miles per hour in the northbound direction and 43.3 miles per hour in the southbound direction on the block between Silver Spring and Thayer. So that's, that's very much over the speed limit. And we also see a, a speed limit, a top speed of 30.1 uh, north of Thayer. So what we, what we found is that about two to four percent of drivers are going above that posted speed limit of 25 miles per hour. If we look at the weekend, uh, we do see that these top speeds are higher than the posted speed limit, but they're not significantly higher. Um, and, they're not, and they're certainly not as high as what we see on the weekdays. Uh, so again, about two to four percent of people are going above the speed limit. So what we can conclude from this is that most drivers are already going less than the speed limit. And the speed treatments that we've shown you, we could install those and they might lower that 85th percentile speed a little bit, but probably not by much because they're not designed to slow people down to like five miles an hour. They're designed to slow people down to that 20 to 25 mile an hour range. Um, and, but on the other hand, the, the types of treatments that we're talking about would be effective at those people who are going faster than the speed limit. So most drivers are already going slower. But if we installed these, it would force those people who are going above the speed limit to, to slow down more. Um, however, we don't think that the speed treatments alone are going to cause much diversion because people are already driving slowly on Grove Street for the most part, and they're still choosing to drive on Grove Street. And I didn't mention this, but the, the, the data was from February. Uh, that's when we collected it. it was the week of February 2nd to 9th. Um, so before the before the the, the treatment um, and also before before the uh, shared street treatment and also before the COVID nineteen pandemic, so we do have time for one or two more quick questions. I, I do want to try and keep us on schedule. I see that Jan Goldstein, you you've had your hand up for uh, since the last time. I'm going to unmute you uh, if you still have a question, and you may have to confirm that you're being unmuted. Uh, um, question answered. Oh, you already got it. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you very much. I'm going to. Uh, lower your hand. Uh, and it looks like uh, Luke Jones. I have unmuted you, so go ahead, Luke. <clears throat> Hi. The time at which the data was collected seems to coincide with the significant construction activities in this area. So to me, it seems that those speeds would be statistically not representative of normal traffic behavior. Uh, yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. So we, we collected the data um, on dates when there was not work happening on Grove itself. So, and, and Robert, if, I don't know if you have, if you want to 
to weigh in on on that. We also have some some ways to um, to check that using other data, including our, our streetlight data. So, do you want uh, Robert to, to weigh in on that? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it is true that it was during or some of the data was um, during the time when they were doing it, but we had a week of traffic when they were not closing um, sections of the road and so our data seemed to be pretty good. We also checked it with, um, we have access to this data is called streetlight data and what they do is they collect information from basically cell phone usage and we can from that we can also see what kind of speeds are going up and down the street as well as the volumes and that also compares to what was previously been on our growth street as well thanks all right i want to keep moving because we do have a lot to cover but we will come back um, if you have additional questions in the future um, and kyle also is, has those questions that you've been sending him by chat so I want to talk about stage two, um, even though it might be in the future, um, we just want to go ahead and, and give some context. So stage two of the pilot um, would be the plan would, would be to add at least one diversionary treatment somewhere on Grove Street in addition to the speed treatments that are being installed. And as um, the reason we call, they're called diversionary treatments is because they are designed to divert traffic um, to, to take a different route. And we can generally divide these into two categories, soft and hard. Soft uh, treatments are tend to be regulatory in nature and hard are physical treatments and we're going to look into how those can work. So uh, the existing shared street that's on Grove Street, that's a great example of a soft treatment. Um, the, uh, the reason it's soft is because there are signs that say that the road is for local traffic, it's close to through traffic, but if you need to drive around the barricade because you're going to your house on that block, you're allowed to drive around it and if you want to drive around it and you can, it's not hard to drive around. So it's, it's soft. Um, and another example would be, a, for example, a time-based entry restriction. So the picture on the left there shows a do not enter and it says at the bottom 7 to 9.30 a.m., 4 to 7 p.m., Monday through Friday. And that's on Glenbrook Road in Bethesda. And this is something that it's soft because if you wanna drive past that sign, you can. If you don't see a cop, you think you're not gonna get a ticket. There's nothing to actually stop you from doing. Um, so these are soft in that regard. They do, they do, they are effective, but they're not as effective as a physical treatment that would actually prevent you from doing something. So that that brings us to a hard treatment. So these are something like a physical barrier that would would prevent through movement or bar entry, and these are much more effective than just a regulatory treatment. Um, so there there are some examples uh, at the bottom left. There you see uh, it's it's labeled one way at block entry. This is also called a partial closure. So in this case, the street, the great the greenway, would remain two way uh, for for almost its entire length. But occasionally at certain blocks, you couldn't enter from a certain direction. So if you were on that block, you came out of your house, you could turn left or right. You can go either direction. But if you were coming from the bottom side of the image and you wanted to enter, you could you'd be forced to turn right or left, and you couldn't turn left or right from this from the side street onto the onto the greenway. Another example is a median diverter and this is would be a physical treatment down the middle the center line of the east west street and it would force all north and southbound traffic to turn right. It would prevent drivers from turning left onto the side street and it would also prevent drivers from turning left from the side street onto the greenway. Um, and then the final example on the right there is a full closure where we could close a portion of the greenway. It would still be open to bicyclists and pedestrians but we could close a portion of it to drivers. Um, it, it could just be a linear closure where it's just closed at one point, or it could be a, a longer closure where there's maybe a, a, a small area that's sort of in between two closed areas to create a, a gathering space. So here are some examples of what we just saw. The picture on the left shows that partial closure. This is in College Park, so not too far away. Um, the picture in the middle shows a, a, a flex post median. Um, we would, of course, in the, if we were building a permanent treatment, we would probably use a concrete treatment, but in terms of the semi-permanent treatments that we're talking about, we could use flex posts. And this would still prevent, this would still um, allow cyclists and pedestrians to cross through here. And this picture is from Washington, DC, where the, there is a crosswalk here, it's out of frame, but there is a crosswalk to the right of the picture. Uh, and then the picture on the right shows an example of a full closure. In, in this case, this is in Los Angeles and it's a triangular intersection and they, they created this sort of gathering space next to a little green triangle and there's a restaurant here to the left, which is why there's some tables out there. 
we wouldn't be proposing like a, a table seating area on Grove Street, um, for example, but we could potentially look into um, creating a small gathering space uh, that could work. And I, know, I know that there was an ice cream social that happened on Grove Street. So facilitating something like that uh, is something that could, could, uh, could work. And then we also have an example of one way being sort of fitting sort of between that soft and hard example uh, because uh, it is a regulatory treatment, but because the whole street's one way, the, it's harder for people to just disregard that uh, that sign and enter and go the wrong way. So uh, this would be potentially an option to make Grove Street one way in one direction or to make Grove Street one way potentially in different directions for different parts of the corridor. Um, of course, the downside of this is that it would mean it applied to local residents also. Um, and what we have found is that Grove Street has pretty imbalanced traffic loads so there this could be effective depending on how it's how it's installed at reducing cut through traffic we have another poll question let me get that set up here we have another poll question um, so you should see a poll here we're asking you do you think the amount of traffic um, and we're looking at before the shared street was installed so did, did you think the amount of traffic was a problem before the shared street was installed um, so, so people are, are voting now. Um, I'm going to give you guys about uh, 15 or 20 seconds more unless, we, unless everyone votes before then. Um, about 80% of you have voted at this point. Um, so I'm going to give you about five more seconds. If you haven't voted yet, go ahead and cast those ballots. And Matt, we got a, we got a question coming through asking um, in what way is Grove Street traffic imbalance? Maybe you could touch on that real quick. We are gonna to touch on that in just a minute. So okay. just, just bear with us just a minute. I'm gonna share the results here. So it's it's pretty close to a tie here. Uh, 50, just under 50% of you think that there, the amount of traffic was a problem. 44% say it was not a problem and 7% say you're not sure. So um, that's interesting to know. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing the results here and go back to the presentation. Um, here's what I mean by saying, by saying that the volumes are unbalanced. So the numbers you're seeing here are the AADT, which is the average annual daily traffic. These numbers were collected back in February. And what you can see in the northbound direction, we're looking at weekdays here, the northbound direction, 1,215 cars driving northbound on the block between Silver Spring and Thayer, only 685 driving southbound. This is looking at the 24 hour, 24 hour period, so the whole day. Uh, between Thayer and Bonifant, 1,318 cars going northbound, only 580 cars going southbound. So it's not, it's, it's roughly double. The, the southbound traffic is, is about half of the northbound traffic, essentially. Now, if we look at weekends, what we can see is the first thing that might jump out is that weekend traffic is actually higher than weekday traffic, uh, which I found surprising. Um, and the numbers are still roughly double. They're not quite, it's not quite as, the disparity is not quite as extreme on weekends, but the, the numbers are roughly double uh, northbound versus southbound. Now, why do we think that there, that's a difference? There's a couple of different things that are going, that's going on here that, that uh, ex can explain why uh, there's a difference. Uh, the first is that if you're going northbound and you're trying to cut around traffic, get around traffic on Fenton Street, you can make a right off of Fenton, make a left into Grove, make a left somewhere else and get a right back onto Fenton Street. So that's not very challenging. But if you're going southbound on Fenton, you have to make a left off of Fenton and then a left back onto Fenton. And those are more challenging because you may have to wait for a gap in traffic, or you may have to wait for a signal to change. Um, so that would tend to incentivize northbound traffic more than southbound traffic because you're going to save more time going northbound than going southbound. Also, PM traffic tends to be a little more congested than AM traffic because in the morning, people are typically just going to work and school. And in the afternoon, people are going home from work and school, but they're also going out to entertainment and other things. Um, so that there tends to be more of a confluence of traffic. Um, and then finally, and this is probably the more critical piece, is that traffic on Cedar Street between Bonifant and Wayne is one way northbound. So this means that if you're trying to cut through from Wayne or from Colesville, you can't use Cedar as a cut through. Um, and so this significantly impacts the amount of traffic entering the neighborhood altogether and using Grove Street. So this is a good example of how one-way treatments strategically um, can impact uh, the amount of traffic that's, that's going through the, through the street. Um, so let's see, we are, I think we're, we have enough time for one or two questions. Um, Kyle, did you have anything that has popped up in the chat that, that is re related to diversionary treatment? Yeah, sure, let me take a look back through. We've got a lot, I've been copying them over. Um, let's see. 
Um, all right, let me, while you're looking, let me, uh, we do have um, Catnap. Catnap, you had a question, you have your hand up. I've unmuted you, um, Catnap. Hi, uh, Kathy Napparella. Um, so earlier in the year, uh, ESCO was asked to vote on allowing um, parents for a proposed daycare on, um, on Sligo to drive in the alley behind the, uh, the art space um, to drop off and pick up their kids. And I just um, wondered if that had been taken into account in um, any thoughts about diversionary treatments. Um, yeah, thank you, Kathy. Um, I, I am aware, I have heard about that. Um, I don't know the details of exactly how that circulation is going to happen. Um, but we, so I don't know that we've really accounted for that yet, but that's a good point that you made. And we will consider that as part of the, um, the design when we actually uh, imp implement, uh, bring something back to you before we implement, implement it. So we will look into that. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, Kyle, did you have a question that you think is um, relevant? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's a question asking about how um, kind of chicanes and chokers and some of these treatments um, could be implemented and how that would affect uh, a walking lane if that's created. Basically, what, what could those work together? Yeah, that's a good question. We are going to talk about the walking lane. That's the next thing on the agenda. Um, so, so bear with us on that one. But in terms of how they, they could work together, the answer is, it kind of depends on, on how the street ends up being set up, but they are not mutually exclusive. We, can, we still can institute um, narrowing and, and both vertical and horizontal treatments as part of the um, walking lane, so they're not mutually exclusive. But exactly how they would interface is something that we kind of, we'll kind of come back to based on the feedback that we get from this community, uh, this community meeting in the comment period. So, um, let me continue by talking about the walking space. That was a great segue, Kyle. Thank you for that. Yep. Um, one of the most frequent comments we got back after our meeting in January was people asking for, for walking space, talking about the need for walking space. Now, we don't have the right of way to build a sidewalk behind the existing curb, and we also don't have the funding to acquire the property. In addition to that, there would be utility impacts, drainage impacts, and all other impacts like moving retaining walls, removing fences, even if we did have the money to buy the land. Um, and just for reference, and you're going to see some sections later, but the right-of-way for Grove Street is 30 feet, uh, 30 feet wide. The existing street is 24 feet between the faces of the curbs, which means there's, there's basically about two and a half feet behind the back of curb on either side of Grove Street, and we need five feet for an acceptable sidewalk. Um, so we don't have room, even if we were to try and shift the whole road over. I know that was a question that I think someone brought up one, uh, earlier uh, to me um, uh, offline. Was That would, of course, be very expensive to move the entire roadway over. But it would, it would also, we still barely would have enough room. And, and we'd get, with the utilities as well, we might not have enough room to make that work. So as an alternative, what we are um, considering is installing a walking lane. So instead of building a sidewalk behind the curb, we want to repurpose some of the road space um, for walking and there would be a barrier between the roadway and that walking space. So, so I just want to show some pictures here for context. What you see here on the left is existing Grove Street. You can see people are walking and biking in the street. On the, on the center picture here we have, um, I believe this is Thayer Avenue with a traditional sidewalk behind the curb that we don't have room for and it's just shown for context. And on the right we have a picture of a walking lane. This picture is from Canada and I have two more pictures here um, on at the left and the center now that are from Seattle. Um, and these are different examples of how walking lanes have been implemented. Um, in, all, in all the cases, you can see that they've installed a concrete barrier curb between, in this case, they're all using a modular curb or, or a parking stops uh, with flex posts to separate the walking lanes from either parking or a, a parking on the left and center image or driving in the right image. Um, you can also see in the image at the left there that they've installed a painted bump out with flex posts and they've added a detective warning surface. This yellow rectangle here is the, the bumpy domes for blind people uh, so they know that they're about to enter an intersection. So these are examples of what we could do for the walk with a walking lane and I just want to show you um, what that could mean. So as I said before, Grove Street is 24 feet between the curbs and that means we have seven feet for parking and about 17 feet for two-way for two traffic. 
if we wanted to install a walking lane, we need at least six feet. We need five feet for the walking lane and one foot for the barrier between the walking lane and the drive and the roadway. Um, and that may mean that we don't have enough room for um, all three of the things that we're trying to put in the corridor. So if we look at the potential sections here, the, the one on the left here shows what it might look like if we made Grove Street one way. So in this case, there's a walking lane on, on the west side of the street um, that's six feet. Uh, including the barrier. We then have an 11 foot travel line and we have parking. So that would keep parking and it would keep traffic in one direction, but it would eliminate traffic in the opposite direction. Um, the center image there shows what would happen if we removed parking from Grove. Then we would have room for an 18 foot travel way. So we could have room for, for both um, directions of traffic, but there wouldn't be room for any parking. And then the image on the right shows a sort of compromise solution, which is uh, we keep the walking lane, we keep the parking, but we also have two-way traffic in a single 11-foot travel lane. And that, now, a car is about six to seven feet wide, so that's not enough room to pass. We would have to create passing zones at each intersection and probably at least in one location along each block, which would um, be, be designated areas of no parking where, where there's room for people to pull out of the way of opposing traffic. Um, so these are different options, um, and we don't necessarily have to do the same thing on every single block either. We can sort of mix and match to some degree, but, but this is what it might look like. And I'm, I'm showing you some plan views, and again, these are just examples. Um, and in these images, the, the red is shown as the walking lane. We wouldn't necessarily have to paint it red. It's just shown to make it more distinctive in this, in this graphic. But the, these are the three options you just saw, how they might look. So in this case, you can see we have the walking lane here on the left. We have a single travel lane. In this case, I'm showing it going southbound. It doesn't necessarily have to go southbound, but that's what this is showing. With then parking on, on the east side of the street, which would be left if you were driving southbound. Hey Matt, we got a, a couple questions coming in here. Um, can you just clarify if bicyclists could use the walking lane? Uh, so bicyclists are permitted to ride their bikes on the sidewalk in Montgomery County. Um, so this would this is not technically a sidewalk by the um, by the way you typically think of it, but under the state law of Maryland, this would be classified as a sidewalk. Um, and so yes, cyclists could use that walking lane for, for riding, but, um, but I, would, I would think that, it, that given the fact that Grove is generally pretty calm most of the day, that it would be okay for cyclists to ride in the street as well. But yes, they would be permitted. Um, just to finish with this slide, then I'll, if you, you think you have another question, Kyle, let me just finish with this slide, which is, this is showing, there wouldn't necessarily have to be a painted center line, but this is showing, it's shown for context with no parking. And then on the right here, this is showing an example of a passing zone. So for example, if there's a driver coming northbound, there's a driver coming southbound, that northbound driver would have to pull into this space and wait for that southbound driver to pass. Um, and so we would have to have a certain area of curb where parking is not permitted in order to enable that. Even though Grove is generally not fully parked, we have to at least, um, we have to ensure that there is a, a, a specific passing zone. Um, Kyle, did you have another question you think is related to this? Yeah, slide? there was one more question uh, as far as the one-way scenario, um, whether you have looked at northbound or southbound, or if at this point you're just considering kind of a one-way conversion. Um, we, yeah, we haven't gotten that far yet. Um, that's kind of the next step. So we, we haven't looked at whether north or southbound would be better or mixing, mixing them so that they're sort of different directions to prevent a, a trip from going all the way through. We don't know the answer to that yet, but that's something that we will look into more. And if that's an option that we want to pursue, we will come back to the community and, and talk about that. And we also want to get your feedback. So we're going to talk about feedback later in the meeting, but if you have strong feelings about this, we want to hear them. Um, uh, either tonight or through the comment process. Uh, so we have another poll question. Let me get started here. Um, one second, let me change to, the, to question three here. Um, I'm launching the polling. So the question we're asking you is, do you, how do you feel about the need for dedicated walking space? So we wanna know if you think we need a walking space, you think we don't need a walking space, or you're not sure. So um, I'm gonna give you about uh, 25 more seconds to vote. Um, Actually, most of you have already voted, so I need all that time. So we got a few more people who haven't voted yet. I'll give you a few more seconds, and then I'm going to close the polling. Um, about five more seconds. If you want to vote, now is your chance. Okay. Um, so let me share the results here. So what you can see is 80%, 80% of you think that a dedicated walking space is needed. And 14% of you think that a dedicated walking space is not needed. 7% don't know or are not sure. 
Uh, and the reason I'm reading, reading these all out loud is because I don't think the polling uh, is captured in the video feed of this, so I want to make sure that the recording uh, has a recording of what was, how the voting went. Um, so uh, we do have time. We've already, we've already had uh, two clarifying questions. Uh, I see that Dan Morales has had his hand up for a few minutes. Let me unmute you, Dan. So you should be unmuted if you want to talk now. Hello. Hi. We Hi. Um, hey, so the, of the three options, I'm really encouraged to see, and again, this is just my opinion and everyone has their own, but we spoke with a consortium of residents that live right here um, uh, to you personally at that meeting about the need for pedestrian safety and kids that like our, my kids, other people's kids who walk that street. So I know people have their own priorities, but pedestrian safety is the main one. And your, your proposal of, on the right um, that showed a, um, you know, a two-way street. That's what I, I was calling a yield street, or that, that's what's known as a yield street. And that, that does everything it, because it slows the traffic down. It forces people to maneuver the way they do on Bonifant. It doesn't touch anyone's property. It keeps parking. So I am uh, I'm, I'm elated to see that you all are exploring that as well as all the other things. Okay, thank you for that comment, Dan. Uh, and uh... I'm going to lower your hand here. And uh, I have Bill, I'm unmuting you now. Bill, you raised your hand. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, the priority of a greenway is pedestrian traffic and bicycle traffic. That's by definition. And five feet for a walkway and some kind of parking, some kind of one way, two way, whatever, doesn't match. Uh, the priority of a greenway, given that we have approximately two and a half car widths. I understand that three cars can go by, but my broken side mirrors differs with the fact that three cars can go widthwise on uh, Grove Street. Um, uh, so my greatest concern is that uh, some of these options kind of contradict the objective based on the limited width of Grove Street. If it were five car car widths wide, uh, chicanes, bump outs, all that, I see that being valid on the table. That's one comment. Number okay. two, um, it was an interesting thing about the fact that there's a lack of bicycle data. So my office window overlooks Grove Street, and I don't count. I don't really pay attention to the, uh, empirical numbers. However, there is a um, uh, majority of bicycles are using Grove Street during rush hour. And so when the volume is high for cars, the volume is high for bikes, and the volume is high for pedestrians. And again, we get into a contradictory greenway is intended for prioritizing bicycles and pedestrians. And if you're allowing cars to go through in any measure, uh, Stephen Lieberman and I were talking about 15 minutes before this meeting, and a woman cut through at a volume of speed, uh, I'm sorry, at a rate of speed that was significantly high and nearly clipped me. Uh, and that's with the road closed. So uh, those are my concerns. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Bill. Um, and we did collect bicycle data. I didn't put it on those graphics, which, which now that you bring it up, seems like a big oversight on my part. So I apologize for that. But we did collect data on, on the number of bicycles so we can post that information on our website. Uh, uh, we won't, I don't think have it, have it available for the meeting tonight, but we can get that posted on our website, so thank you. Um, I do want to uh, move on. We have a little bit left, um, but we're getting close to the end of the presentation and we're, and we're gonna have a breakout session where we can talk about these, these um, in greater detail. So um, we talked about doing this as a two-stage pilot and as someone has already asked in a question earlier, things have changed since January. Uh, First off, COVID-19 is here, um, and the, re the resulting shutdown in the economy has reduced traffic volumes across the region by about 30%. Um, so that means there's less congestion, there's fewer vehicles altogether. Um, also, since January, we installed a temporary shared street with soft diversionary treatments. Um, and also, we talked about doing this as sort of an experiment with baseline data and then collecting data each, each stage going along. but because of the COVID-19 situation, traffic counts are probably not gonna be comparable to the pre-COVID-19 numbers. 
So what we are already considering doing is doing another set of baseline data before we implement the fall treatments just to see if we can sort of calculate uh, a new baseline. Um, but we, this makes us wonder, uh, does it still make sense to do the pilot the way we thought we were going to do it back in January, or does it make sense to uh, rethink things? And maybe, maybe instead of having a speed only and then a speed plus diversionary, does it make sense, you know, since we already have a diversionary treatment that's in place right now, does it make sense to go ahead and implement a diversionary treatment in sort of stage one of the pilot? So this is the, another poll question for you. We're going to ask you, um, does it make sense to continue to have a two-stage pilot um, or would it be better to institute a diversion treatment this fall? Uh, I'm going to launch that polling now. And again, it's asking you keep the two-stage format or go ahead and add a diversionary treatment in stage one, since we already have one out there. Um, I'm going to give you guys about 20 more seconds to vote. Um, you're not voting quite as fast this time as you did in the last question. So I guess you're thinking about it. Um, all right, I'm going to give about 10 more seconds. We're, we've got about 75% of the people have voted. So it looks like it's still trickling in a little bit. Matt, could you clarify the question one more time? We just got a comment that um, it's a little confusing as to what the two-part uh, aspect of it is. Well, the two-part would be speed treatments only in stage one in this fall, and then adding in, in the spring, adding at least one diversionary treatment. Uh, what that would mean is we have a diversionary treatment out there right now that would go away. So the street would be completely open again, but speed treatments only. And then a diversion would be added back in stage two in the spring. And what we're asking is, does it make sense to do um, speed plus diversionary in the fall? And we might only do a one stage pilot, or we might do a second stage where we change things, um, you know, move something around based on what we've already uh, encountered. So I'm gonna end the polling now. Looks like almost everybody voted. And I'm gonna share the results and, um, what we see is that the, the winner here is 53% uh, say that we should go ahead and include a diversionary treatment in stage one. 30% say we should keep that same format that we talked about back in January. And 16% say they don't know or they're not sure. Uh, so I'm going to stop, stop sharing the results now. And now I want to talk about some next steps. So based on the feedback that we get tonight and through the comment process, we're going to develop an implementation plan. And we're going to come back to the community probably at the beginning of the fall with an implementation plan uh, where we can get additional comments. This is not your last bite at the apple. You will get another chance to give us your feedback. And then in the fall, we will install the first round of treatments, whether that's speed only or speed plus diversionary. We're gonna kind of see what the, what the community feedback is tonight and, 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 uh, and over the next two weeks as we get comments. And then throughout the process, regardless of which approach we take, we are gonna monitor the treatments to see how they're working and we can make modifications if necessary. All right, so we are about to go to the breakout sessions. Um, and uh, let me just go over some, um, some basic ground rules. So we want you to please be respectful of the other attendees, uh, make sure everyone has a chance to speak. Um, and in just a minute, I'm gonna make sure that you all have the ability to unmute yourself, um, but it's, a, it's good practice to keep yourself muted unless you're actively speaking so we don't get any background noise. Um, if you're dialing in by phone and you don't have access to the computer interface, uh, you can unmute yourself by dialing star six. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable asking a question out loud, please use the chat feature to chat to your facilitator so that each group is gonna have a facilitator from the staff or consultants and a note taker from the staff or consultants and the facilitator, you should identify yourself as the facilitator once everyone is in your breakout group. And um, they should be at the top of that, that chat list because they're, the, they're a co-host. So, so send that chat to your facilitator. Now, what we want you to focus on while you're in these um, breakout groups is, are there any particular blocks or intersections that you think have problems? Um, we want to know how you feel about the walking lane. Um, we want to know if there are any of the treatments that we talked about tonight that you think are really great or you think are really terrible. We want to know. And if there's any other concerns you have about this project, uh, we want to hear those too and anything else that you think we need to know. So we're about to break out into the breakout groups. Um, the, uh, we're going to return to the main session at 8.20. That gives you a little over 20 minutes. And then we're going to do a report back. So let me, um, uh, let me make sure that you can all unmute yourselves. Um, so you now all have the ability to unmute yourselves. We're going to go to breakout groups. And please bear with us. This is our first time doing this kind of format. So Kyle, have you set it up so that we have a facilitator and a note taker in each of the breakout groups? Yes, I have. All right. Well, open the breakout sessions. And also, a reminder to our facilitators, 
um, that we are we are going to record the breakout sessions. We're not going to post the breakout sessions on our website later, but we want to record them so we get we make sure we get an accurate record of what was said. Um, and Kyle, I think since you're already recording, the recording will stay with you when you go to the breakout group. Sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and open the rooms. So you should get a message to join a breakout group. You're going to want to uh, click yes, click join, and you will go to the breakout room. All right, so um, I am um, muting everyone. Um, uh, so you do not have the ability, once again, to unmute yourselves uh, unless you're one of the co-hosts. Um, that's just to, to cut down on the, on the background noise. But I think everyone is back in the main room. We did have a little bit of a, I told you we were going to have some hiccups it was our first time doing this. So one of the hiccups, we discovered that if you join the meeting after the breakout rooms have started, we don't have anybody to get you in the breakout rooms. So unfortunately, um, that was, uh, we did have a few people who were not able to join the, um, the, uh, the breakout room. So I, I apologize to them and, and hopefully the next time around we will um, uh, have a, a better go of things. Um, all right, so we are gonna now do um, our report back. So each of the breakout sessions, I had a note taker and that note taker is gonna be the person who uh, kind of gives us the gist of what you guys discussed in your session. So we're gonna start off with breakout group one first. I believe, Dan, you were the note taker there. You do need to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So um first question was any particular concerns uh looks like uh one, one of the concerns is the current conditions uh with construction uh and illegal parking by construction workers is going to skew anything that we might do uh and Im impact the pilot project uh and, and the poor pavement uh condition as well um let's see uh, and then, uh, so a couple people said that, and another one was at Thayer and Grove, there's a fair number of accidents. So the concern was through traffic on Thayer, concern for uh, if we're uh, prioritizing pedestrians and bicyclists along Grove, we gotta watch out for T-bones along at Thayer. And another one was uh, maybe an unintended consequence of the, uh, the street, as it is now with the uh you know closed street is that a lot of people are running stop signs so the second question was how do you feel about the walking lane um and a couple people said uh the walking lane uh is definitely the way to go with improved lighting um uh, another person said they didn't agree with the walking lane uh they they felt that they could walk along there except between the hours of 5 and 8 p.m. Uh, so they were thinking maybe a uh, do not enter sign between 5 and 8 might be the answer instead. Uh, another person said they love the walking lane concept uh, and, you know, uh, and, and with the concern about one or two-way traffic, but the most concerned about protecting the pedestrians. Uh, question three was what type of treatments? Um, uh, one person liked the cutout treatment and perhaps a circular roundabout. Uh, one person said they weren't sure how with chokers the pedestrians would give, be given the priority. Was the room, I guess the, the issue was, was there room with four chokers and pedestrians? And uh, I think that was it. Uh, Again, so I think that was it on that. Uh, Tim did. Tim Couples did say that there is a way to uh, have these uh, measures and allow pedestrians the uh, the preferred right route. Uh, question four: What treatment do you want to see? Do not want to see. Uh, um, three or four people said they do not want to see a one-way situation. Uh, one was okay with the one-way situation, but does not want to see speed measures. Uh, you know, walkways were the most important person for, 
important part for that person. Uh, another person does not want to see speed measures. Again, speed measures. And then the last one was any other concerns. Uh, uh, one was just the difficulty and challenging of collecting our baseline data during these conditions, both with the construction and COVID. But we sort of talked about the COVID one. And then uh, another was just a concern. Uh, we've got to be concerned with stormwater uh, along along there while we're making our treatments. And then a big thank you. So that was all. Uh, thanks, Dan. One note before we go to the next section: um, if you were in, a, if you were the person in the breakout group who's recording, except for Kyle, uh, you can stop your. I think your recordings continued in the main session. So uh, if you don't mind stopping those recordings, except for Kyle, who's recording the main session, so you keep recording, Kyle. Um, I just and also to our um, our note takers, we, we do have when I get to the question and answer period and the comment period. So try and keep these report back to like three to four minutes tops. So uh, group two, I believe Katie was the note taker. Thank you, Katie. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Yes, so um, I took a lot of quick notes, but um, I highlighted what I think were the most important things. But all of this stuff will go to um, Matt and his team. So if I didn't say anything. Doesn't mean it wasn't recorded. Um, so when we were talking about the specific blocks, we heard from folks that live closest to the art space development that there was a lot of um, effort that was made to keep the on-street parking. So there was a little bit of concern about any treatments that would be removing parking for those two southmost blocks. Um, there's also a little bit of a concern that if they if some of the east-west connections are um, hindered, that making it harder to get to Fenton Street and other streets east and west of Grove Street might actually mean that more traffic stays on Grove Street, so that might be an unintended consequence. Um, another noise that was, uh, that was made was that, yes, we're talking about Grove Street, but this is also meeting speed and volume is a big problem throughout the neighborhood. So like beyond this pilot, we should be thinking about this on a greater context scale. Um, speeding especially was mentioned multiple times. Um, there was a lot of consensus about the yield condition um, model. Bonifant was mentioned multiple times saying that that seems like kind of a great compromise because you get people who can get to their homes very easily, but at the same time they have to slow down and by slowing down a lot, it dissuades people from using it for through traffic. Um, an example of this in extreme uh, tech was, was talked about in um, the Bethesda and Chevy Chase area and how like it really dissuades you from going and using that customer multiple times. Uh, there's a lot of interest in getting sidewalks or a walking lane, just any sort of designated space for pedestrians. There's been some observations that people are walking more now, and it shows that people are interested in walking in the area, even, um, but before the, the conditions just like aren't really nice for that, which also brought up another point, which is that um, lighting is a real issue. There were people who talked about from the motor's perspective, it's really scary to come up on a pedestrian that you're not expecting and you can't see very well. And as a pedestrian, it makes you not want to walk because it's, you feel like you're not seen and you feel like the motors don't see you. Um, lastly, um, it seems like there was some interest in getting the flow stop. And um, it sounds like there's interest in closing northbound traffic on Grove between Fair and Easley, keeping southbound open. That sounds like a good plan um, based on both the data and people's experiences. And um, furthermore, lane closures rather than the other treatments would seem to be the best of both worlds. Well. All right. Thank you very much for that, Katie. Um, we also had group three, and I believe, Robert, you were the note taker for group three, so if you'd unmute yourself and yep. um, give us a report. Okay. Um, our group had kind of pointed out that the um, intersection of uh, Sligo and Grove, um, there's blind spots, and as you're turning onto Grove, that it's um, hard to see the pedestrians and traffic. And that same issue is also at uh, Ripley and Grove. And a suggestion would be there for, can they uh, prevent uh, vehicles from coming out of Ripley because you, they can't see the pedestrians walking up and down Grove. Um, they have to pull out too far to, uh, to be able to see traffic there. Um, they also mentioned that the, on Grove Street, um, as you're coming from Sligo, you go down a hill and then um, they're not necessarily stopping at uh, Spring Street. And we also have uh, some stop sign running at Thayer. Um, they felt some, there was 
quite a few of the uh, cut through traffic was going from Sligo to Thayer to Houston. They did like the um, head bump outs or at intersections, um, to having the uh, bump outs at those locations. Other people had suggested that they don't think there's enough width on the existing streetway to um, provide a lot of the treatments that you're having that's already narrow. Um, I believe they've also had issues of losing their uh, side mirrors. Um, our group also, there was a couple people that liked the one lane uh, or one way traffic with uh, parking. Um, they felt that the narrow 11 foot lane two way traffic, they feel that people already now are playing chicken going up and down the street. They're uh, speeding up and trying to get to the uh, a place where there's no cars parked. So they feel that that wouldn't be a safe thing to do it with an 11 foot lane there and they were also concerned about enforcement of some of these uh, diversionary treatments. So that's what we have. All right, um, uh, thank you Robert. Um, for group four, I believe Angel, you were the note taker. So if you want to uh, yep. give us the report back, thank you. Sure, uh, so I think a lot of the um, a lot of the comments is already kind of highlight and kind of echoing in our group also. Um, one of the things that uh, was mentioned multiple times with that was that um, a walking lane would be super important uh, for, for everyone uh, where a pedestrian needs to be uh, with the focus of these treatments. Um, and also like the, the lack of um, street lights on, on, on Grove where uh, motorists are, uh, it's, it's difficult for motorists to see pedestrian is uh, walking on the street, especially at night. Uh, some of the other things that were mentioned was um, people are not following the uh, regulatory sign, whether it's stop sign or use sign. Um, and since the, um, uh, the, uh, the implementation of the shared street, um, uh, it seems that uh, some of the cut through traffic that used to use Grove Street, uh, Grove street has been diverted onto uh, uh, other street that is parallel, such as uh, Houston. Um, and the other, uh, one of the other things that uh, was mentioned was that um, uh, they would like to see more data uh, that is uh, collected, uh, you know, on various spots of the intersection. Um, because um, there are uh, intersections such as, uh, such as uh, Sligo and uh, Silver Spring that are, uh, wasn't really mentioned in the presentation, and they would like to see that. All right, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Angel, for that report back. We also had group five and David Onsbacher, I believe you were the note taker in group five. So if you don't mind give us, giving us a report. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, let's see, one of the problem intersections that was called out by our group was the intersection of Grove Street and Silver Spring Avenue. Um, it's, it's very steep there. So particularly in the northbound direction when people are going down the street, um, a lot of people are just, um, in particular bicyclists, are um, just riding right through the stop sign. Um, there was, there seemed to be uh, several people that were in favor of a walking lane on Grove Street. Um, there was some support for the Yield Street approach, uh, particularly as it helps to reduce speeds. Um, lots of support for making Grove Street safe for kids to walk on in particular. I, we heard that a number of times. Um, uh, one person from our group was asking though, how are we specifically reaching out to students? And um, she offered her support and I can give you her name um, in the notes. Um, one gentleman uh, was talking about how tight the road is already. His um, his car has been hit five times. His, his mirrors have been hit five times in the past year or two, I believe it was, um, due to how tight the road is already. And so it seems in, it's gonna be challenging to fit everything in. Um, 
Uh, and and you, one young woman was speaking about the shared street signs and how we should really use that as an opportunity to encourage people to wear masks there during this time. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, we have one more group, uh, group six, and I believe Andrew, you were the note taker in group six. You have to unmute yourself. I, I think something didn't work right because there wasn't a group six. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, I guess we got everybody. Um, so uh, were, were there any other groups? Anybody in a group that hasn't been reported back yet? Just making sure. Okay. Uh, in that case, um, uh, that was good. We got the report backs done a little bit ahead of schedule, and that means that we can um, move on to the question and answer um, format. Before we get to that, um, I just want to thank you all for attending the meeting tonight. Um, we really do want to get your feedback because this is how we make our projects uh, better. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can share your thoughts with us. Um, first off, please visit our um, Grove Street webpage. Uh, which is available at the, the link you see here on the screen. Um, you probably all got an email from me with that link as well. Um, we have a survey which is linked from that website and that survey, um, also this, this PowerPoint is available on the website so all these are clickable links if you, if you download the PowerPoint. Um, the uh, survey will ask you a lot of the questions that you heard tonight but also some additional questions so if you haven't had a chance to fill out the survey I really encourage you to do that. And then if you have any comments that you would like to, to um, send us by email, I would, uh, or in written form, I would strongly suggest email because we'll get that right away. But if you, if you do want to write it down and mail it um, to the post office, uh, you can send those, to co those comments to um, the address that you see here on the screen. Um, the way we're going to do question and answer um, format tonight is um, you're going to need to raise your hand. I, mean, I have a slide here that, that shows um, how to do that. Hold on one second. Um, uh, just a moment. Um, so in order to raise your hand, um, first off you need to click the participants button, then that will open this window, and then you click raise hand. That's how you raise your hand. If you want to ask a question via the text feature instead, um, you click the chat chat um, menu, and then you want to select Kyle, put Kyle Lucas as the person you're sending that chat to, and Kyle can read that question out or that comment out. So. We do have a couple of hands that have been raised. Um, so let me, um, hold on here one second. Uh, Tom, um, you are now unmuted. You've had your hand up for a while. I'm not sure if you um, still have a question or not, but you should be un able to unmute yourself now, Tom. Hi, thanks, Matt. I just wanted to add a comment uh, on speeding and that the, uh, you know, I, I know the District of Columbia has recently lowered the citywide speed limit, or at least for a couple of areas from 25 mile, miles per hour to 20 miles per hour, uh, or even, you know, there's talk of lowering it to 15 miles per hour, sort of the minimum speed limit. Um, so while, you know, it does seem like traffic on Grove isn't speeding, and I'm using air quotes here, um, you know, a car going 21 miles per hour down a residential street with people walking in, it still seems dangerous. So it's mostly just a, a comment. Great, thank you for that, um, Tom. Um, Phil K, I'm unmuting you now. Um, you may still have to confirm that you are okay with being unmuted. Yep, thanks. Um, can you explain in terms of how you're gonna make your decision after the pilot, if the goal is to encourage or to allow for walking and biking, how the metrics that you're gonna collect in terms of how, for example, how fast the cars are going, are going to you know, inform your decision-making as to whether you know, the different interventions allow for sufficient biking and walking? Yeah, that's an excellent question for that. Thank you for that, Bill. Um, what, what we're gonna do is we're gonna monitor the, the data and we wanna see if there are any unintended consequences. So what we want to know is, you know, we put something on Grove Street, and if it's, drive, if it's creating a new problem on Houston Street, well, we may either need to rethink that, that, that treatment, or maybe we need to add a treatment to Houston Street. So, so the idea is to measure that, the data so that we kind of understand how effective these are being. Like if we add in a treatment and it doesn't reduce the travel speed at all, then it's not being very effective. Um, so we wanted to kind of know what the, what the consequences are of these different decisions. 
so in terms of making a decision for um, whether to make these permanent or not, that's something that we're going to come back to the community at the end and we're going to say, look, you live here, you drive on this street, you walk on the street, you bike on the street. Are these working? Um, do you like them? Are they causing problems that we didn't foresee? Um, and if they are working well, I think that we will work on on trying to, uh, and also if they're well received by the community, we will work on trying to make those permanent. But if they're not working well, or if there's something that's causing a big hardship in the community, then that's something that we can we can take into consideration about whether we should keep it or uh, remove it. So that that's kind of where where we're going with that. So thank you for that question. Um, I'll just chime in to say we've gotten a few comments about Houston Street uh, in particular. So yes, and and I I, uh, I did mean to. Um, uh, to mention that earlier in the presentation that we understand that the shared street on Grove Street has caused some additional traffic on Houston Street and we are looking into whether or not we need to um, make any changes to Houston to create, uh, to alleviate some of that to some degree. So that is definitely something that we're considering. So, so thank you for that. Um, Jane, it looks like um, you have your hand up. I'm going to unmute you now. So you, you may have to confirm that you want to be unmuted, but go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Thank you. So I was wondering, do you guys do scenarios of travel? So for example, if someone lives on Grove Street and they want to go downtown or they want to go to the Beltway or they want to go to Sligo Avenue and then you can track and see what the routes are going to be and if they are um, logical or nonsensical or you know, throw um, traffic different ways. And also I want to know, do the weight of the, re is there a weight of the residents who live on the street versus the people who just, who live around? And the third thing is, why is the alley being called Ripley Street? Because I know there's always a significance between being called an alley versus a street. And we really worked hard on keeping traffic a certain way on that alley. And there are no street signs on it. So I just wonder what repercussions there are on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the for those questions. Um, I'm gonna. I wrote. I was writing them down, so uh, I'll try and get back. Try and get to all of them. Um, so, in terms of how do we decide if a if a route works for an individual resident on Grove? I mean, the it's a this is a big challenge for us to figure out how do we do stuff that discourages through trips without completely putting the neighborhood into a straitjacket because. We don't have the ability to just say, well, only you can only drive here if you live on the street or if you live within a block of the street. Like it's either sort of an either or situation. And um, so one of the ways that neighborhood greenways tend to work in other places is by making it more inconvenient to cut through than it is to stay on the main route. So if you live on Grove Street um, and, and we make it one way, for example, and you, you know, let's say we make it one way southbound and you want to go north. You know, you can go one block down to the nearest street and then go out to Fenton and, and sort of go around the block. And that may be inconvenient, but that's not a, not as big of an inconvenience as someone who wants to go north and has to go like four blocks out of their way. And that might be enough to discourage them from driving on Grove Street in the first place. So in terms of do we do scenario planning, we are going to look into how this would impact, you know, how many residents are impacted, um, how many trips potentially are impacted. We have some data from uh, a, a what Robert mentioned earlier called streetlight, which, which does track how, how vehicles move. Um, so we, we do have some ability to kind of figure out what the, the minimum way to impact people is. Um, in terms of uh, the weight of residents versus non-residents, um, what we, re we really want to find a solution that works the best for as many people as possible. And I know that we're probably not going to be able to make everybody happy. That's unfortunately a consequence of doing the job that I do is there's no way that I can make everybody happy. Um, but we really do want to try and find a consensus in this neighborhood so that we're not, we're not trying to hurt one group of people and benefit another group of people. We're trying to create a solution where everybody has a safe street to walk and bike and drive on. Um, and then everybody is still able to get where they need to go within a reasonable amount of time and with it, with, without having too much um, inconvenience. But at the same time, we do have to introduce some of that into the system in order to discourage those through trips. So it is a balancing act. And um, I'm sure that uh, we're not going to make everybody happy, but we're going to do our best to try and, and, uh, and balance everyone's needs. And then your final question is, why is the alley called Ripley Street? Um, I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, I've seen it labeled as Ripley Street on maps 
before, but um, you're right that there's not a sign on the street, and I'm not sure that there's really a difference. I don't know, Michael, I don't know if you know the answer to that question. You're shaking your head. Yeah, I don't, you know, as soon as the comment was was posited, I immediately started trying to do some research on the side, and, and I can't come up with a with a good reason for the fact that it's not signed, but now my curiosity has been piqued, so <laughs> I'll be investigating that. All right, thank you for that, Michael. Um, next up, Sarah Osborne Bender. I'm unmuting you now. You may still have to click a, click a button to say that you want to be unmuted. Okay, thanks. Um, this is somewhat related to Jane's question. Uh, we've really appreciated the Greenway while it's been in place as a pedestrian, but for driving, the area is so congested. Fenton is a really tough uh, street, especially, I mean, I know that we have right now, we have uh, construction going on, but I just wondered if in combination with some of these, uh, some of these other options, I wondered how effective local traffic only signs are. Is that, I know Shepherd's Park uses them between say, Alaska and Kalmia, and I just wondered if that was uh, being considered or whether they are not effective. Well, there's always the question of what local traffic is uh, in terms of, I mean, we, we could define local traffic, but everyone might define it a little bit differently. Um, and it's hard to enforce. So like other soft treatments, if it's really easy for someone to drive down that street and hard to enforce, it's going to be less effective. That doesn't mean that we can't do something like that, although that Michael uh, might need to weigh in on, on, on whether we can use that particular treatment or not. But um, it won't be as effective as, as something that, that physical that prevents someone from driving down the street. Okay, um, so uh, next up we have Bill. I'm unmuting you now, Bill, but you're still gonna have to click a button to unmute yourself. Yeah, I just wanna make a comment about the surveys, which I was very surprised by. Um, there have been comments about volume and speed in this entire area, and I think any resident in this area would be hard pressed to say that they don't have too much volume on their street and that there is, uh, everybody is driving just fine, the speeds are just fine. So I, I, was, I kind of balk at the survey questions that since putting your weight into saying there's no problem with volume or speed on Grove Street is in your favor to say that because you need it as a cut through. Um, uh, that was the, the main comment that I had. Um, and I, I do want to come back to this is a pilot project for a greenway and the primary objective is pedestrians and bicycles. And uh, I think that needs to be kept in mind if this is a pilot. Um, my last comment, um, uh, in this COVID period, People, everybody I know complains about not being able to get on Grove. Everybody. There's not a single person that does not complain about not being able to use Grove. Um, uh, in the pilot project, is there any way to extend the period of the pilot so that people can adapt to, to, to new patterns? Um, I, I honestly don't remember exactly how long the time period is but I sort of feel like a couple months is just not enough time. Is it possible to have a six month period? And if you get just a six months of constant complaints, then you know it's too long, but uh, establishing new patterns is very difficult. We are behavioral as animals and I have a hard time. I often find myself having to take different routes because I forget that the, it's local traffic only and I gotta get on the Fenton to get to my house. So, um, you know, is there a chance that we can have a long enough period that people can adapt to different patterns? Uh, thank you for that, that question, Bill. Um, yeah, the answer to your question is, you know, how long the pilot's gonna be in place. Um, our, our plan is to have the pilot in place for roughly six months. Um, and if, the, again, if the pilot's successful, uh, that we would, um, could, could keep it longer. There's no, it, just because we're calling these, we're calling these semi-permanent for a reason instead of calling them temporary because we're not just going to put them out and then take them up. If they're semi-permanent in the sense that if they're not causing problems, we're going to leave them in place. 
Um, or, and, but of course, if there's a big community outcry, we also can remove them. But our goal is to leave them in place for at least the period. Of, for stage one would be at least three months, and for stage two, at least three months. Um, for all our projects, and I do a lot of capital projects, there's always a learning curve. We uh, put out median refuges on, Gro on uh, Strathmore Avenue in Grosvenor to create um, a, a cro a two crosswalks big concrete islands with a big, you know, big sign and a big yellow reflective sign on it. And uh, someone ran, ran over it the first week it was out there because people are not used to, you're right, the people are not used to change. People are not used to having, there was a median there that wasn't there before and they're so used to driving the way that they always drove, drove that they drove right over it. Um, so there's always a learning curve for these things. And if we put something out there one day and the first day it causes confusion, that doesn't mean we're going to rip it up the next day. We do, we do need to give people a chance to get used to things and to find new patterns and, and for a new equilibri equilibrium to form. So uh, the answer to that question is it will be out there for at least six months, although if we're doing it in two stages, it might be different in the first three months than it is in the second three months. Uh, and then um, potentially it could go, go uh, much longer than that. Uh, our next uh, person with a, a hand up is a uh, Dimeline M, I'm unmuting you now, and you may have to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Um, well, I just wanna say thank you for um, such um, a thoughtful effort here and for taking a holistic view, um, because I, I was concerned at first that the um, impact that the treatments um, could have on um, the next street down, which is used as a cut through Houston, um, could be an issue. Um, and it's great to hear that you're um, aware of, of, of the potential impacts and concerned about it. Um, I am um, curious to know, um, uh, because Houston is right along Bullis Park, um, it seems like it would be a candidate for being a greenway, given the number of pedestrians and bikers and um, you know skateboarders who are making their way to the park. Um, is that something that's under consideration already? Uh, so uh, David Onsbacher here is from the Planning Commission. He might be able to answer. I I'm not familiar with enough with whether the bike plan indicated that Houston was going to be a neighborhood greenway or not, but. Um, just because it's not in the master plan does not mean that it's not something that we can can do as part of a transportation project. But uh, David, do you have any uh, feedback on that? You're on mute. Hi, everyone. Um, there's lots of streets out there that I would say are, would be candidates for slow street treatments, but not necessarily neighborhood greenways. Um, neighborhood greenways were intended in the bike plan to really parallel um, faster streets um, or streets with a lot more traffic, such as Benton Street. That doesn't mean, of course, that um, DOT can, wouldn't want to look at ways to slow traffic down on Houston, though. Uh, thank you for that uh, answer, David. Um, so I am going to call on our next person with a hand up, Debbie R. I'm unmuting you now. You should be able to unmute yourself and uh, give us your question or your comment. Okay, so my first comment is I have been walking on Houston several times a week and I'm surprised how few pedestrians and bikers are using it. Um, but my question is why was a greenway, this temporary greenway, done when there is so much construction on Fenton that's causing traffic backups. And this is when there's light traffic because most people are working at home. So I don't understand the logic about setting it up at this time. It doesn't seem to be giving an accurate picture of what's going on. Um, and it's also, I think, going to create when people go back to work, more problems making turns onto Fenton from Thayer, from Silver Spring Avenue, particularly Thayer, where you don't have a left turn lane. Are there thoughts of changing traffic light patterns? Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for that question. In terms of why the treatment was done, now as opposed to um, some other time. Like the other shared streets that are being done around the county, this was 
implemented primarily because we have a unique situation where people need to stay six feet apart. Um, and we were trying in area, we can't do this in every street, of course, but we were trying to find streets that um, helped people connect to other places, which um, we used the, the, the bike master plan to determine which streets had already been identified as being sort of connecting routes for, for people who were walking and biking, um, areas that helped connect to transit, um, and, and, to, and areas that didn't have sidewalks, especially. So Grove Street has a has a, a good amount of traffic on it, but doesn't have sidewalks, so it's very difficult for people to stay six feet apart um, and be safe. We also have similar shared streets, like for example, on um, in, in Bethesda, downtown Bethesda, Woodmont Avenue is a, is a streetery, which is a different kind of shared street, but that's an, an area where we have closed the street to cars in order to, pro to provide space for people to eat at, and essentially sidewalk cafes that are in the street where they're socially distanced. So um, you're right that there is construction on Fenton Street, although Pepco is supposed to be wrapping that construction up relatively soon, is my understanding. Um, I know they're a little bit behind schedule, but um, we understand that it has created some difficulty in, in getting to the neighborhood, but what we're trying to do is maximize pedestrian safety and bicycle safety and also to create space for social distancing. And this was really, it, I mean, it's happening at the same time as we're talking about a neighborhood agreement, but it really was a separate effort, not part of this project. And so in terms of collecting data, we're not, this is not part of the project where we're collecting data to compare to the baseline because it's not really part of the pilot project. It was a separate effort that just happens to overlap with our, our time between the baseline collection, data collection and the first stage of the pilot. Um, so, um, uh, let's see, our next, our next uh, hand is uh, Catnap. I'm gonna unmute you now, Catnap. Hi, um, I just wanted to endorse the idea of um, trying soft barriers at, um, at um, you know, at particular times. I know that enforcement is considered an issue, but I've noticed that in um, several places, sporadic enforcement, you know, ticketing a few times a month definitely works um, to stop people from doing it again. If you are ticketed or you see other people getting ticketed, that's a serious deterrent. And then the other thing is, is that we also have um, cameras that I, you know, it makes sense that a camera would be able to be programmed to take pictures of um, violators at particular times. So, um, and you know, it is something that is, these things are kind of easier to undo. Um, you know, like right now, if we wanted to undo the share streets, you only have to move a few signs. So, um, you know, I just, would like to say that I hope that those types of interventions won't be, um, you know, pushed to the side because of enforcement, because I do think that there are tactics that do work. All right, thank you for that, uh, that comment. And I will say that in terms of the camera enforcement, I think that that would be extremely effective at uh, stopping cut through traffic during certain hours, but uh, it would require state legislation um, to create. We have, um, the st there's state legislation to create speed cameras and state legislation to create red light cameras, but we don't have the ability on our own to just create camera enforcement. There would be a requirement for the state legislature to pass a law to permit the county to um, use camera enforcement for um, violating the um, uh, time of use um, entry restrictions. Um, our, our, uh, but, but it, uh, your other question was whether we could try these, these soft treatments. I think that um, these soft diversionary treatments, if, if, we, if we decide instead of doing the speed only treatments, uh, instead of trying to do a diversionary treatment during stage one, we could potentially do a, diver a soft diversionary treatment during stage one, and maybe a, maybe a hard diversion treatment in stage two to kind of compare the effectiveness of those. Um, that might be a, one variant of how we could do this. And so if you have any, um, if you have any, uh, thoughts on that, that's something that we would love for you to, to share with us um, through either the survey that's online or through emails. Uh, Tim Haverland, uh, I'm unmuting you now, you had your hand up. Hey there, Matt, how are, how are you and, and team? Uh, just a comment um, just on, on behalf of the East Silver Spring Citizens Association. Um, 
I want to thank you all for uh, a great uh, a great meeting and providing such a great forum for everybody to uh, provide their input. Um, you know, as you know, we've been um, trying to get this kind of conversation going for probably 10 years. So uh, just thanks um, for a job well done. Well, thank you. And thank you for all the hard work that your uh, organization has done to bring people together to have this conversation. So we, we couldn't do it without, uh, without groups like yours. So thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, I know it's, it's nine o'clock right now. We have one person with their hand up. So we're going to answer that question and, and we can stay a few extra minutes. If, so if you have a question or comments that you want to get out and you haven't asked it yet, put your hand up right now. Um, but Ariel um, Bierbaum, I'm unmuting you now. Thank you. Um, thank you all for a great meeting. And um, most of this meeting, you had my husband because I was doing bedtime, but um, <laughs> I caught the beginning and the end. Um, and I do want to thank you for uh, a great virtual <laughs> experience, um, despite the challenges. I want to just echo something that I think it was someone named Bill said earlier about how this is a Greenway project. Um, and I, I, I want to, I want to, encourage the the planners and the planning staff to really think about how we're centering the pedestrians and the cyclists and a lot of this conversation is about centering motorists and cars um, and I think that one thing that's really disappointing to me is that there wasn't an effort to actually pivot your research in light of the COVID intervention it seems like a really missed opportunity to collect data on like a bonus intervention that you guys didn't even have to really do anything <laughs> about vis-a-vis -vis this project. Um, and so all the anecdotal data that we now, or information that we have about how much it's being used that I think other residents have seen, and I'm certainly using it more and see other people out in the street, that's all gonna get lost um, because it's not being systematically captured as part of this project. Um, and, and that's really disappointing and I would encourage you to think about if there's a way that you can start more formal data collection as part of this process um, now on this and actually list it as a potential menu option because that is an intervention and it was an initiative that 100% did not like sort of cater to or be concerned about vehicular traffic. It centered pedestrians and said what do we need for bikes and peds and it just got done. And it got done because we're in this awful extreme circumstance. Um, but if this is a Greenway project and that is the stated priority of Greenway projects, I'd like to see sort of the business as usual interventions also take up that same approach when we're trying to prioritize bike and ped. So if there's a way to consider, you know, sort of again, naming this as a, as a potential experiment as part of the, the bigger Greenway initiative, but in a formalized systematic way. I think that would be really great because the intervention is fantastic and it actually gives me a lot of hope and optimism and excitement for like what Grove Street can be once we're sort of through all of these pilot things. It's really been encouraging. So, and again, thank you all for all of your hard work. Of course, thank you. Those are excellent points. Um, so we, we kind of can get some of the data. We have the streetlight data, which Robert mentioned earlier, which is sort of continuous data. So we are able to kind of compare, but that mainly is going to be focused on drivers, not on other users. But I, I think that it does make sense, given the new circumstances, for us to try and collect some additional data. So we can talk to our consultants about uh, maybe adding some, some additional data counts into our scope to see if we can calculate uh, or collect data about what uh, how people are using the street as pedestrians and bicyclists compared to how they were using it in February. So that's an excellent point, uh, point well taken. So thank you for that. Um, we have two people left with their hands up, so I'm going to take those questions and then we will call it a night. So Jane, you have your hand up. You are unmuted. Oh, thank you. So thank you for the meeting. And then thank you, Bill, also for reminding us that the objective was the Greenway project. And I just wanted to remind people that Fenton was redesigned to be a traffic calmed. They took away two uh, lanes, uh, probably before your time. And that was to try to get the traffic back on Georgia. So I was wondering, is that part of your traffic goal to get people all the way up to Georgia, not on Fenton um, versus Grove? And thank you again. Thanks, Jane, that's a good question. So we, uh, this, this, the goal of this project is not necessarily to direct people to get back onto Georgia. The, the goal of this project is really to get through traffic off of Grove Street. 
Um, and what we have found in other, in other locations is that sometimes uh, when you make it more challenging to drive on a particular street, not all that traffic goes somewhere else. Some of the traffic just goes away. Uh, and the reason for that is because people are incentivized to do certain behaviors when, when there's less congestion. Um, so some people may be able to take metro or they may be able to walk or bike, but because it's really easy to drive, they do drive. And when it gets harder to drive, they go back to taking those other trips. Um, whether that's necessarily replicable here, I, you know, I, it's premature for me to say that, but what we have found is that just because there's traffic there today does not mean that that traffic is going to move somewhere else necessarily. It may just evaporate, which does, does sometimes happen in, in our profession when we, when we study, when we study uh, these corridors. So that's really the goal there. And you're, you're right that the Fenton uh, calming did happen before my time, although there are some staff members who are still at the department who were around back then. Pat Shepard, who's on the call today, was, was in the county government back then when that happened. Um, so I'm very familiar with what happened, but I, I was before I had moved to this, this area. And honestly, um, I'm going to get my, my age away here, but I was in high school when that happened. So, um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to mute you again, Jane, and I'm going to um, call on our last hand, and that is um, Bill. I'm unmuting you now, Bill. Thank you. Uh, I think I'd like to just offer a second to what Ariel said, um, again, from my perch of my office at the house, I can see what's happening on the street, and there's a lot, uh, a lot more pedestrian traffic starting to use the, the uh, local traffic only on Grove and getting to downtown. If there's any way that you guys can figure out how to capture that data, whether you do surveys on the street, uh, whether we leave posters up, or proof posters where people could put check marks, I, you know, uh, capturing that voice that is not privy to get on uh, Zoom sessions like this, et cetera, uh, would be important. Uh, uh, and I'd like to end by saying, I think you guys have just done a great job. I I'm impressed with how you use Zoom and uh, I appreciate everybody's attendance and, and the, the staff's efforts on this. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bill. Um, I really do want to thank everyone again for attending. I know that um, this this may have been easier for some of you to attend than a public meeting would be, but it may have also been more challenging. And we definitely had some some challenges that that uh, that we wouldn't have had in a, in a regular meeting setting. So I appreciate you all bearing with us as we learn a new format. And I'm sure that you're going to see more of these over the next couple months until we're getting back to a normal, a more normal uh, way of of um, interacting in public with each other. But um, I know that this is your neighborhood and uh, we really do want to try and make it better for everyone. So thank you all for attending tonight. I really do want to encourage you if you have any questions, comments, um, please send those to me by email. Uh, we really like to get those comments within the next two weeks. So if you can get those to us before the end of the month, that would be really helpful. Uh, and again, you can mail them to um, my office and this presentation is available on our website if you want to get that address. Um, email is the best, however, matt.johnson at montgomerycountymd.gov. So thank you all uh, very much for your time tonight, and I hope you all have a good evening and stay safe and stay healthy.